Good morning. Good morning to you. I must say, I, I don't believe, I've worked in Europe for 30 years. I, I've, I've mm -hmm. never been to your region. I, I apologize. We will have to correct that in the, in the coming months. Hope you will have time to visit us also sometimes in the I, future. Uh, it's beautiful. Well, I like Formula One and I like Zaha Hadid <laughs> architecture and I like yeah. uh, the movies and I like, you know, that you've done a, you've done a wonderful job modernizing that, uh, that uh, your, your yeah. character. Thank you. I've, re I've heard many of your interviews. You eloquently explain in great detail the complex issues uh, facing the region. I must be blunt, uh, as, as to the point, and concise, and short as your answers, yes. and we can get more answers on. But I, I fully understand these are very complex issues that go back hundreds of years. Yeah, I will try to try to explain to the American audience, you know, what is happening and why it happened and what we what we want to see in the future. That's great, that's great. Well, we are very interested, we are very interested. By many accounts, on September 27th, your forces began this latest round of war. There was a, a relative peace in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. There was some kind of a diplomatic framework that people had an idea to resolve this crisis, but the fighting started. Why did you decide to move out? It was not Azerbaijan who started the fighting on the 27th of September. So far, no official representative from any country uh, actually raised this issue in front of us. It was Armenia who launched an attack on the 27th of September, and the purpose was to disrupt completely the negotiation process. They did more or less the same on July, when they attacked our forces on the state border between Armenia and Azerbaijan and they were uh, suffering the bitter defeat. And then they sent a sabotage group uh, on August to penetrate through our military positions and to attack our civilians and military personnel. So on 27th of September, they started uh, artillery bombardment from the heavy artillery weapons. And in the first hours of the attack, we had uh, victims among civilians and military servicemen, so far we have 63 victims among civilians and almost 300 of them wounded. So it was Armenia, we just had to defend ourselves and to respond, and our response was very adequate. And as a result of that, we managed to liberate important part of occupied territories. But regardless of who sh shot the first shot, there was fighting basically right away on both sides in that period. And in the follow-up, you said, in fact, that you would want to remove all our Armenian forces from this area and that that would only be the answer that could resolve this crisis. And in the months leading up to this September 27th date, there was much talk of war and action in Azerbaijan. You have to admit you were looking for war. Uh, what I was saying was in line with the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Back in 1993, uh, security resolutions adopted by United Nations clearly demanded from Armenia complete, unconditional, and immediate withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And unfortunately, uh, during 27 years, these resolutions were not implemented. So when I was saying that we want uh, Armenian troops out of international recognized territories of Azerbaijan, I am right from legal point of view, and what I say is in line with Security Council resolutions of United Nations. We were Mr. talking. President, yeah. Mr. President, there is legal and there is reality on the ground. Reality on the ground in Nagorno Karabakh and the region is that it's a now, after all the trouble that you went through back in the 80s and the 90s, a principally Armenian population. If you went in there, you have to, again, remove Armenians and bring our Azerbaijanis back, yet another displacement. Uh, there is a diplomatic plan on the table to keep Nagorno-Karabakh in independent, for Armenia to give back seven of these areas around it. Did, does diplomacy, uh, did and does diplomacy make no sense to you? Uh, what you said about diplomatic solution is not uh, correct because there is no plan uh, presented to us from the mediators, United States, Russia and France, to give Nagorno-Karabakh independence. Not at all. In the peaceful plan, 
There is a proposal. No, 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 not at all. In the peaceful plan, there is a proposal, there is a point that all the occupied territories surrounding Nagorno Karabakh, uh, which uh, the territories which have been inhabited by Azerbaijanis, and more than 700,000 Azerbaijanis were ethnically cleansed from those territories. So these territories must be returned to Azerbaijan. And the realities on the ground you are talking about is the realities as a result of aggressive separatism from Armenia and ethnic cleansing against Azerbaijanis. All Azerbaijanis have been expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh. There have been 40,000 of them before the war. All Azerbaijanis have been expelled from seven regions surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh with 700,000. My point so, is- Mr. President, Mr. President, in 1994, you lost the war. Now in 2020, you want to restart the war to win the war. We did not lose the war. We lost the battle. That was due to objective reasons. First, there was an internal uh, instability in Azerbaijan. Armenia took advantage of that. And well, second, my point and second, is, why, why 2020 do you want to restart the war? I mean, it's been calm for uh, 20 years. And second, that was due to the open uh, external support to Armenia. We did not start war. We just responded. And we do it uh, based on the United Nations Charter. United Nations Charter provides the right of every country for self-defense. What we are doing, we are defending ourselves, and we are liberating internationally recognized territories of Azerbaijan from Armenian occupation. Nothing more than that. And with respect to Armenian people, I have said many times that Armenian people who live in Nagorno-Karabakh are our citizens. We will take care of them. They will live in dignity in peace, side by side with Azerbaijanis, who will return there. Mr. President, why are you resisting calls from the UN, as you mentioned, Russia, Iran, the United States, the EU, NATO? Why are you resisting calls uh, for a ceasefire and, in fact, breaking two attempts to create a ceasefire? And I know today that's what Secretary of State Pompeo will be asking for, a ceasefire to to exchange bodies, to exchange wounded. Isn't this a good time for a ceasefire? We were ready for ceasefire. And on the 10th of October in Moscow, our foreign minister, Armenian foreign minister, and Russian foreign minister issued a joint declaration about ceasefire. But the next day, the next day, Armenians from the territory of Armenia launched an attack on the second largest city of Azerbaijan, Genja, situated far away from the uh, area of clashes, with ballistic missiles killing 10 civilians and wounding more than 30. Then there was a second ballistic attack on Genja, killing 15 people. So it was Armenia. It was Armenia. ceasefire as well? No, no. We just responded because we agreed about ceasefire two times. The first time, Armenians at night, at 1 a.m. at night, launched a ballistic missile on a sleeping city. Second time, ceasefire lasted only for two minutes, and Armenia violated it. There is no evidence that Azerbaijan violated ceasefire. But let me put it this way. If Secretary of State Pompeo today puts it to your foreign minister, the U.S. really wants a ceasefire, another try. Will you give it another try? Yes, we are ready. I said many times publicly. We are ready to uh, agree on ceasefire today, but at the same time, Armenia, its prime minister, should say that they are committed to the basic principles elaborated by United States, Russia, and France. Armenian prime minister two days ago said that there is no diplomatic solution to the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh, and he sends so his. There's got to be a string attached. But well, but that's what he said. Ceasefire with no strings attached. We want ceasefire. We want our territories back. Armenia should commit that they will liberate territories according to United Nations Security Council resolutions and according to the peace plan presented by U.S., France, and Russia. But he does not say... Yeah. Mr. President, how do you respond to charges that your military is inordinately targeting civilian areas? Homes, residences, stores, even a very important church has been hit by your high-tech weaponry, uh, thousands have either been killed or injured just in the past four weeks. We do not attack civilians. After uh, Armenian brutal attack, uh, act of terror against the city of Ganja with ballistic missiles where dozens of people have been killed, 
we uh, publicly said that we will take revenge, but on the battlefield. We do not attack uh, civilians. We do not attack uh, religious sites. What happened to the church in Shusha was either a mistake, and I already publicly commented on that, or it was done by Armenians themselves in order to put a blame on us. So our Again, president, we are seeing video scenes of the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, all the population there has to live in basements. They're hearing artillery every 20 minutes. Their city, where civilians are living, is wrecked. You can't call the entire city a military target. There have been military targets in the capital of uh, so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, Hankendi, and our attacks there were only before 9th of October. We did not attack any civilians or cities in the Nagorno-Karabakh after that, but they attacked. And have you seen the images of what they've done to Ganja? What they've done to Ganja? To October 9th, you were targeting civilians were no 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 we were targeting military uh, infrastructure in the so-called capital of nagorno karabakh hankandi because military bases military infrastructure is situated in the city you have drones from turkey you have military gear from israel you have high-tech equipment from russia how can you use that and not also hit civilians no 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 our drones our drones and these images are a lot of them in internet you can look how our drones destroy armenian tanks and other weapons so far our drones destroyed more than 230 tanks we destroyed six s 300 uh, anti-air missile system we destroyed hundreds of their uh, armored vehicles. We do not use drones for civilians. This is false information. Let's talk about the soldiers, the troops that are in action from multiple sources, from France, from Russia, from independent respected journalists at the New York Times, for example. They absolutely assert that Syrians, militias gathered and transported by Turkey in their hundreds are now fighting your war. Why do you have Turkish-backed Syrian militias fighting your war in Azerbaijan? This is another fake news, and I regret that Russia and France, the only countries, by the way, which uh, publicly commented on that, made such an irresponsible statement. And I demanded, and still demand, proofs, evidences. It's more than 20 days after the war have started again. So far, not a single evidence or proof was presented to us, neither by Russia nor from France. The evidence was in the New York Times. I direct you to a story five days ago that says that 57 Syrian fighters killed in Azerbaijan were brought back across the border from Turkey and buried in Syria. Their families all attest that they went to Azerbaijan to fight alongside your army. Do you know, do you remember how President Trump calls New York Times? Fake news. This is fake news. No evidence, no proof. Give us evidence, not only New York well, I'm Times. I'm curious. You, you have 100,000 soldiers. Why, why do yes. you need some scrappy... Exactly. Militia? We don't need them. Well, it's a good question. Why? We, we don't need them. That was I was talking about. 100,000 soldiers in the regular army, plus maybe a couple of three times more soldiers we can recruit within a couple of days, plus modern equipment. We don't need any mercenaries at all. This is fake news just in order to damage the image of our country and in order to diminish the bravery of our soldiers on the battlefield. Mr. President, uh, let's get back to the timing of this, why we're seeing military action now, why we're seeing clashes. Critics of your government, of your presidency, say that you are using this war as a smokescreen to deflect attention from problems in your own country, social issues, economic stagnation, corruption, COVID-19. Are you using this just to pull the attention of your own public, maybe dissatisfied on a lot of different accounts towards a patriotic battle? No, no, this is absolutely wrong. First. Our economic performance is one of the best in the world. Economic decline in Azerbaijan in the 10 months uh, is less than 4%. You can compare it with your own country or with European countries. Level of unemployment in Azerbaijan is 7%. Compare it with your own country. 
level of poverty in Azerbaijan is 5%. Compare it again. We don't have serious social problems. On COVID-19, Azerbaijan is considered as an example by World Health Organization. We provided support to more than 30 countries, financial support, humanitarian support. Our economy is stable, our economy is sustainable, and there was no need, as you say, in order to cover some of internal problems in order to launch the war. It was on the other side, Armenia, who is completely now in economic and social problems, they need to distract attention. It's Armenian Prime Minister who puts leading opposition uh, uh, party um, leader to jail. He is pursuing but two Mr. former presidents. President, we know there are some accusations of human rights abuses within in your own government and uh, suppression of, uh, of, of freedom of speech and specifically talking about the, the corruption and the, and, and the family rule of both the government and many of the uh, corporate structures. So you're, this is not to pull the attention of your public or some members of your public away from those uh, considered misdeeds by some people. No, no, no. Corruption is here and we are fighting against it. We've introduced a broad economic reforms program and uh, many people, many governmental officials and high ranking officials have been arrested recently for charges of corruption. Uh, corruption is everywhere and we are fighting with it. Uh, with respect to the family rule, again, I'd like to refer you to your own country where important, you know, positions were held by father and son. Uh, just Bush family, Clinton family, husband and the wife, Kennedy family, and in many other countries. So it's nothing uh, different from what is happening in the United States. And, well, they were all uh, elected democratically and transparently. Yeah, especially President uh, Bush, who was elected by the decision of uh, U.S. High Court. And uh, our... You, you, know your, you know your American politics, Mr. I know, I know, yeah. I am well, pre I am well prepared for that. <laughs> let's uh, let's go to the United States now. Let's let's. What would you like to see today, and, and in the future, Secretary of State Pompeo do? There has been some criticism of, of, of Secretary Pompeo and the U.S. that they haven't been enough engaged. I know Russia is quite involved. Turkey in various ways involved. Even Iran is offering help. What would you like? Has the U.S. done enough? Would you like to see the U.S. do more? What would you like Washington to do? I think that the U.S., as one of the three co-chairs of the Minsk Group, has a mandate from OEC to help parties to come to an agreement. An agreement must be based on international law. It should not be based on what I want or Armenian Prime Minister wants. It should be based on international law. Nagorno-Karabakh is recognized by United States and all other countries as integral part of Azerbaijan. So what I can expect from Secretary Pompeo first, to tell Prime Minister Pashinyan's envoy that statements like there is no diplomatic solution is wrong and dangerous. Second, statements by Armenian Prime Minister that Karabakh is Armenia is dangerous and wrong. And they should be reasonable. They should give us a timetable for withdrawal of occupied territories. They should agree for peaceful coexistence between Armenians and Azerbaijanis in the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. And they should stop trying to internationalize the conflict. They should stop asking Russia for direct military involvement. This is counterproductive. All the efforts of Armenian Prime Minister during these times is to ask Russia to send troops to fight against Azerbaijan, and this is very dangerous. Well, to that point, I mean, that's another criticism of Secretary of State Pompeo, and he directly says, and certainly the U.S. and Turkey have as many areas of, of commonality, but he says Turkey's assistance of your effort is actually causing problems. It's fueling the flames. How do you react to that? Turkey provides political support to Azerbaijan. It's our closest allies and friend, and we are proud and happy that we have a, such a great country as our partner. Every country has a right to have friends and uh, allies. Uh, Armenia has its allies. Back to Turkey. I mean, Turkey has been pushing for war. Turkey no, no. No, Turkey not at all. Is the way to go. Not at all. Not a single evidence about that. Turkey only provides political support, and this is enough. Because when Turkey says that they stand side by side with Azerbaijan, 
and Azerbaijan is not alone. This is a message to all those who may want to penetrate and, uh, you know, provide their interests with respect to the conflict. You did offer an important uh, uh, line uh, when we were speaking just a short while ago. You, you said uh, in our discussions, in your discussions with uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, that there is a diplomatic solution. Do you believe there is a diplomatic solution to this crisis? Yes, I believe. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been in the negotiations for 17 years. You were trying to say that I launched the war. But if I launched the war, why should I wait for 17 years? Azerbaijani army is well prepared already for at least 10 years already. Therefore, diplomatic solution is on the table. Armenia must liberate territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. Azerbaijanis must return to those territories and then live in peace and dignity with Armenians. That's our position. So you're saying diplomatic solution, but with a military overlay. I said that uh, I uh, wish the military solution stops today and we move on negotiation table. This military uh, factor is causing a lot of damage and a lot of victims, unfortunately. Therefore, the sooner we start substantive negotiations, not imitation like Armenia wanted to do all these years, but substantive negotiations, the sooner the resolution will be found. And the resolution is based on territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. The worry of some outside of your country, outside of your region, and perhaps what should be the worry of yours as well, is that this contained conflagration becomes a wider regional problem. You have Turkey with a real interest. You have Russia with a real interest. You have Iran with a real interest. Are you risking uh, your own standing as a country of, of, of stature, both economic and politically, to get lost in some kind of a regional maelstrom that, that you could have a, a part in, in starting. All our efforts during the conflict was aimed to stop uh, active uh, phase as soon as possible. And we are completely against any form of internationalization of the conflict so that conflict spreads over. That's what Armenia wants to do. And as I said, they asked Russia to send military uh, personnel to the area of conflict, which is uh, absolutely uh, counterproductive and which is completely in violation of international law. We don't want well, other countries are, to interfere. Military bases in Armenia already. Exactly. They, in they, Armenia, they, yes. Uh, they are not illegal. Yes, it is in Armenia, but not in Nagorno-Karabakh. What they're asking Russians to send troops to Nagorno-Karabakh, and we know about that. Therefore, our position is all the regional countries and all the countries should stay away from direct involvement in the conflict. Those who want to help and those who have a mandate, Minsk Group OSC, Minsk Group coaches, must persuade Armenia, I hope it will happen uh, today in Washington, to stop aggression, to commit to ceasefire, and to make commitments that they will leave the territories. They don't do it. There was a, an expression during the Gulf War that it was all about the oil, okay? You've got oil pipelines, energy pipelines within, I don't know, 50, 60 miles of the fighting. Are you concerned that your very important energy pipelines and, and connections could be disrupted by fighting one side or another? And in fact, maybe that is helping to drive your military to conduct this war? Actually, we are concerned because we heard uh, statements uh, from uh, high-ranking Armenian officials that they will attack our strategic oil infrastructure, including pipelines and one of the biggest uh, oil and gas terminal in uh, Sangachal uh, district of Baku. And uh, the July clashes where Armenia attacked us took place 15 kilometers from the gas pipeline, which is supposed to provide energy security to Europe. So it was Armenian plans to disrupt oil and gas supplies from Azerbaijan to uh, Europe and to the world, because so they again, know- would part, would part of the motivation of what you're doing right now is to defend your economic interest against any threat oh. like that. No, we are defending ourselves. You know, our oil pipeline from Baku to Mediterranean was commissioned in 2006, and it works, you know, without any disruption. Our gas pipeline from Azerbaijan to Turkey was commissioned in 2007. A big pipeline to uh, connect Azerbaijan with European consumers is going to be opened 
in a couple of months probably, maybe even less. Therefore, why should we launch a war in order to protect the pipeline when the pipeline is already protected? It's Armenia who wants to disrupt the pipeline and to make economic damage to Azerbaijan. Are you satisfied with what the President Trump, President Trump and his administration has been saying about the conflict? He has been critical of Turkey, but frankly, he has been critical of both sides. Uh, he is weighing a, a very large Armenian diaspora in the United States. So there are political elements in this, too. Do you think the United States is handling its role well? I think what President Trump does with respect to the conflict resolution is fully in line with uh, uh, international relations. We fully support uh, his position, his personal comments on that. And uh, we see that the position of United States is balanced, and uh, as it should be, because United States is mediator. Uh, President Trump's uh, comments on uh, criticism on Turkey, I didn't see it, by the way, in the press, but his uh, comments were constructive. United States does not take sides as other co-chairs should also don't take sides. We understand internal politics, not only in America, but also in France and Russia, with a very large Armenian community, which influences, which has a lot of lobbying activity, and which is now in full operation against Azerbaijan. And we understand the level of pressure which they can uh, you know, impose. But at the same time, a very straightforward position of President Trump is highly supported here in Azerbaijan, not only by me, but our people also. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you know politics, and I bet you know American politics too. We are 10 days away from a major presidential election. In figuring out this uh, move towards diplomacy in Washington, do you think the idea of, uh, oh, maybe a diplomatic success might be figuring in the minds of my Washington uh, politicians? and? Having said that, do you, do you find that's okay? Any motivation to get things going? Any motivation in order to put an end to hostility is supported by us. And I think that uh, today's uh, meeting in Washington can have a very good result only if Armenian will commit to peaceful settlement, will stop attacking us, and will make commitment that they will withdraw the troops. Therefore, I, do, you think it's, do you think it's driven by U.S. presidential politics, this diplomatic effort today? Well, uh, I don't know. I think that the American voters will uh, make their vote uh, uh, based on their you know, uh, approach and their assumption of uh, what is the best for America. I don't think that Karabakh conflict is something which American people are concerned about. Maybe most of them even do not know. But of course, America as a superpower it has a, a very important say in this conflict resolution, and our uh, position is that uh, America, as a mediator, should continue to be neutral and should try again and more and more to bring both sides closer to the uh, you know, common decision. But let me pick up on that point as we conclude this in the next uh, two minutes. Why should the United States care? I think you're probably right. Most Americans couldn't find Nagorno-Karabakh on a map, but there are strategic issues you're dealing with, political, cultural, demographic. If you were talking to the United States people now and said, excuse me, I know you've got the presidential, I know you've got a World Series baseball, but you should pay attention to this too. What would you tell a typical American why it's important for us to care and look at this? I would say that Azerbaijan has always been a very true partner to the United States. We are together on the fight against international terrorism. We are together in Afghanistan, and we keep our uh, military servicemen in Afghanistan, thus providing the course of uh, our peacekeeping operations. We have important uh, topic of, uh, on our agenda as energy security. United States always strongly supported Azerbaijan's efforts to diversify its energy uh, supply routes, and with the strong support of the United States, we managed to complete important projects. Azerbaijan and the United States uh, have a very uh, strong partnership relations, and the uh, United States considers Azerbaijan as a friend, and we are really friends. Therefore, uh, it's in, in the interest of the uh, United States that there is a peace here, and Azerbaijan continues its path 
on the route of independence, strengthening the independence. We are situated just between Europe and Asia on the crossroads, transportation, energy. Our political importance is growing. Therefore, Azerbaijan is an important partner to the United States and the United States to Azerbaijan. So stability in your country, in your region, politically, economically, et cetera, could be good for us as well, uh, 3,000, 5,000 miles away. Yeah, America is a superpower. The distance doesn't make any difference. And I think that a modern, secular, uh, friendly Muslim country is uh, also a big asset for our friends. And the uh, United States, from the very first years of independence, always supported Azerbaijan. And today I can tell you we have maybe the highest ever level of uh, our bilateral cooperation. And we, we hope that today's meeting in Washington will be important to persuade Armenia to stop aggression, stop occupation, and then peace will come to our land. There is a lot of support, though, for Armenia, as you noted earlier in this interview, in the United States. There's yes. support for the, for the Christian religion there, for the churches there, for the diaspora, the, 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 the punishment that they incurred many years ago by Turkey. So you know there is a warm emotional feeling towards Armenians as well in the United States. Yes, I know that. And uh, I said before that we understand the internal politics and the Armenian lobby organization. But when we look at the issues related to international relations, they must be principles, emotions, feelings, you know, some other, you know, uh, expression of uh, goodwill is different. It can be in the family, it can be at the dinner, but international relations, there is an international recognized territory of Azerbaijan, which is occupied by Armenia. So the occupation must come to an end. And those Armenians who live in America, who live in France, who live in uh, Russia, the rich people, they don't care about those Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. How they live in poverty. They will probably disagree with you on that one, but well, okay. Two, two final questions. Back to presidential politics. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden might be the president-elect in uh, 10 days' time. Have you ever had any contact with him, maybe in his vice presidential role? And how do you think a Biden administration would, uh, would deal with this, uh, with your uh, conflict right there in your region? Yes, I met uh, Vice President Biden uh, four years ago in Washington at the nuclear summit, which was organized by uh, President Obama, and I had bilateral meeting with uh, Mr. Biden, and uh, I saw that he was deeply involved in the regional issues, and we discussed many issues of our bilateral relations, of course, including Nagorno-Karabakh settlement. I can tell you that uh, Obama's administration was very active on the Nagorno-Karabakh track, therefore, Mr. Biden, and I'm sure the people who, who support him, they are well aware uh, about that. So I have very good uh, uh, memory of our meeting with him. Do you think he'll, he'll be favorable to your position? Will he be favorable to Armenia? Will he, he probably will talk against uh, war. I mean, he probably will also push for ceasefire, push for diplomacy. Do you think that would be an okay approach? I think uh, taking into account what we've just discussed, the Armenian lobbying organizations in America, in France and Russia for Azerbaijan, the most favorable situation would be that the leaders of these three countries stay neutral on the conflict and don't take sides. Actually, that's what their mandate dictates them. If they take sides, they cannot be mediator. And we expect from uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy team uh, in the future also to be neutral and to be objective. Finally, Mr. President, your prediction for the future. I mean. Uh, your region, your country, uh, Armenia, such horror, late 80s and early 90s, in particular, tens of thousands of people killed. Are, what are we looking at now? Tens of thousands of people more killed, more destruction. How do you see this going forward? It is difficult to predict now what will happen. It not only depends on us, because uh, the war is not held by uh, one country. It's not a unilateral process. but. How I want to see the region, I can tell you. I want the region of Southern Caucasus to be deeply integrated. I want that the strategic relations which we have with another South Caucasian country, Georgia, uh, can be, to a certain degree, a model 
of relations between Azerbaijan and Armenia once in the future, because all wars stop and peace comes. We know how... Uh, you think there can be a peaceful resolution of this conflict? Yeah, definitely. Find that diplomatic answer. I am absolutely confident, but it depends on the will from Armenian side. What happened after the Second World War? Germany and the United States were killing each other. Soviet Union and Germany killing each other. Tens of millions were killed. But look now, it's not any longer in the memory. It's not, uh, you know, provoking hostility. Why Armenians and Azerbaijanis cannot live together in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh while they live together in Georgia, in Russia, in Ukraine, in many other countries? I think that the so Southern there Caucasus... Be, there Caucasus can be peace at the same time recognizing the rights of both sides. Yes, exactly. It must be based on the reasonable, uh, you know, background within the framework of territorial integrity of Azerbaijan with full protection of rights and concerns of Armenian population of Azerbaijan. That, I think, that is doable. Mr. President, thank you very much for this lengthy uh, interview. And uh, I'm sure it will inform uh, not just me, but uh, our American public